Welcome, everybody. We're so glad that you're joining us today for our fifth Snake River Dinner Hour. This will be a moderated conversation among a group of experts with our moderator, Julie Trimmingham, asking questions. This month, June, is Orca Action Month in the Pacific Northwest, and we're excited that today's event is one of many Orca Action Month events and activities throughout the PNW. Tonight's dinner hour topic is how does dam removal affect orcas? We're going to discuss the largest river restoration opportunity in history, the regional benefits of stopping orca and salmon extinction, and the solutions we can find together if we have the courage to have that conversation. These aren't easy issues to discuss, but we're doing it here today. Our final webinar is coming up next month, and it will zoom in on the science of why the removal of the dams is essential to stop salmon extinction, as well as its impact on our larger ecosystem. You can sign up for this at snakeriverdinnerhour.com. We also welcome you to drop questions in the chat in the Q&A box, although please know that this is a conversation, kind of like a dinner party, so we may or may not get to your question. To wrap us up tonight, we'll have Mershka Ketchkesh, a grassroots organizer with the Sierra Club, share some opportunities to provide public input on this process. We're honored to have Julie Trimmingham as our moderator today. Thank you so much for being here, Julie. I'll hand it off to you. Thank you so much, Johanna. Um, I want to welcome everybody here and to express my thanks for being asked to moderate this conversation. I love salmon and I love killer whales. And so I'm just so delighted to be here sharing this time with you all and um, especially with our, our featured guests this evening. But before we get going, I just want to acknowledge that I'm zooming in from traditional Lactamish or Lummi territory in the greater Coast Salish region. And I believe that being here on Lactamish territory gives me both the privilege and the obligation to help caretake these lands and waters in the way that the Lactamish people have taken care of these lands and waters since time immemorial. So I want to um, give my thanks for, for being here on Lactamish territory. Our first, well, I'll just introduce you to our guests. Um, first, I'd love to introduce Tamas. Ellie Kinley, who is the president of the Sacred Lands Conservancy, and Ellie and I work together. She's also a tribal fisherman. Um, secondly, I'd love to introduce Giles, Dr. De Deborah Giles, but she goes by Giles, and she is the science and research director for the nonprofit organization Wild Orca. I don't see Giles here yet, but she will join us shortly. Dr. Les Peirce. Les Peirce is the former co-chair of the Washington State Southern Resident Orca Task Force. And all of these people just, by the way, have super impressive bios and they're being dropped in the chat, I believe, so that you can learn a little bit more about each of these um, amazing guests that we have. And lastly, we have Dr. Rob Williams, who is a senior scientist at the Oceans Initiative. Oh, and there's Rob, and we will um, we will welcome Giles when when she's able to to join us. I thought that we would start our conversation about orcas, killer whales, and salmon by going back to the very first relationship between humans and killer whales, uh, specifically the southern residents. So Ellie, I'm wondering if I can ask you to talk a little bit about your relationship to the Southern residents and the, the Lactamish, the Lummi relationship to Quithalmichton and um, the Southern residents in particular. Welcome everyone. Um, our relationship with Quithalmichton is very strong. It's it can be seen in our carvings from hundreds of years ago. I think even back then they knew that people, salmon and orcas, we all, we all depend on each other. And the only way that all three of us, if the salmon thrive, the orcas thrive and we can thrive. And I think that balance has been out of whack for a while. And I, I believe we need to make a change with that. 
but the Lummi have stories about uh, Kohomichton. And we, fe we feel they're our family. They're our family that just lives under the waves. They put on their underwater regalia and live under the waves. But so yeah, we, we consider them family. And more specifically, I want to back up. I used the term Kothalmichten, which I'm trying my best to pronounce it correctly, and you've used it, but I'm wondering if you can share with us um, what that actually means. The people that live under the waves. And Rob, I'm so glad to, to meet you because I, um, I'm wondering if we can switch to the science side because I I listen to a term like the people that live under the waves. And it seems to me that science yet again is slowly catching up with indigenous knowledge in terms of the more that we learn about killer whales, the more that they really do seem like people. They really um, do have incredible intelligence and society and rituals, all of that. I wonder if you can address that a little bit. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, um, <laughs> force a habit. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. And I think it's a beautiful question. Um, and I, 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 I love the phrase, uh, you know, people beneath the, the waves. Um, I think, I think the, it's a beautiful phrase because we can relate to it and we can't at the same time. I think the parts that we can relate to um, of, of being mammals and having mammalian bodies and having our senses, you know, we can imagine what it's like to swim. Um, but then there are sort of otherworldly um, senses that killer whales have, you know, that their, their brain is, is devoted to sound. Um, I think that sound is as important to the orcas as all five of our senses are to us. Um, yes, they have many things in common with, with us. Um, age of sexual maturity is about the same. The lifespan is about the same. We're one of a few species who share uh, a really vital role for postmenopausal females um, as grandmothers. And, you know, so in that sense, yes, we can relate. But in terms of their cultural bonds, um, speaking only for my own culture, I can't relate to a society in which there is no dispersal. Um, there is never dispersal from the natal, the family unit, you know, where usually in most human societies, most mammalian societies, once the offspring reach sexual maturity, at least the boys go off and form some other group. Uh, and the idea that somehow um, Southern resident killer whales stay in these matriarchal societies, matrilineal societies, um, and have for generations it is astounding. And the fact that they've come up with ways that even with a song, with one call, they can, t they can, they can convey who they are um, with one word, with one call. I think there are some ways that we can relate to that. And there are some ways that we just have to kind of sit back and just admire how extraordinary their way of being is. I, I guess I would like to just add to that. Um, I recall at the beginning of the uh, ORCA task force, uh, the numbers of people that first came to join us with their concerns. And in the beginning, uh, incredible, sad, but incredible and powerful thing occurred. When Tahlequah carried her baby for over a thousand miles and it was broadcast all over the world. And it was like the orca was speaking to all of us and that they had a sense of what the work was and the centrality of it. And the result of that was that in that year of work that we had, there were people that came from all over the world internationally that traveled to give testimony during that period for us. The numbers expanded, the diversity of people that were engaged, and it added an energy and a commitment to those 50 people, very diverse and different people. 
in a way that I have never seen in my years of public service, everyone. And I see that Giles has joined us from her boat and I want to um, talk a bit about Giles in a, a second. Hi, Giles. Um, but just to to add to the, the conversation that we've started about the people under the waves, um, I'm not a scientist, but one thing that always strikes me when I'm learning about killer whales, about Kohalmichten, is again, not only what Rob brought up, that they, our Southern residents always stay together with their moms, but they have social rituals. So I'm so glad, Les, that you brought up Tahlequah and that this is a ritual of grieving that my understanding is mothers will often go through. But what was extraordinary about Tahlequah is that she did it for so long and she did it so publicly. And she seems like we believe that um, we, meaning Ellie and our coworker Raynell at Sacred Sea, where we're, we're doing work for them, she was speaking to us. Like I, I believe that they, we regard the killer whales, but they're watching us too. They're figuring us out. So there is a relationship between us and them, which um, even for those of us who are newcomers is rich and amazing. But for the people who have been here since time immemorial, it's, you know, it's that much richer. Um, I just wanna, I don't know what Giles is doing out on the water, but I wanna switch topics just for a second because I can guess, um, maybe what she's doing because Giles, are you with your dog by any chance? I don't know if she can hear us, but Giles goes out on the water with a dog who is amazingly able to sniff out tiny bits of killer whale scat. And from that scat, she can discern vast amounts of information. Is that what you're doing now, Giles? And I think you might be on mute. There's the dog. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm so sorry we were late getting uh, getting online. We're um, actually out here with JPod and uh, um, Lime Kiln Lighthouse House uh, on San Juan Island. And uh, very much of a surprise. We had no idea uh, that they were going to be around today so um it's been pretty spectacular and i'm really sorry i just slightly lost track of time um so we're uh live streaming here from uh from a cell phone terrific uh, yeah it's pretty amazing to see you in action and with the, the dog there and just for our participants in this who might not know j pod k pod and l pod are all the southern residents and they're all um, family to Ellie and the Lactamish people. Um, and Ellie and I, I don't know when you first met Giles, Ellie, but I know I first met Giles when Lummi Nation was working to feed Scarlet, J50, who was a little four-year-old. And Les, you mentioned Tahlequah and starvation being such an issue, starvation because of the lack of Chinook salmon. And um, Scarlett had what's called peanut head, where she was so skinny, mm -hmm. she killer whales aren't supposed to have a neck, but she had this, this neck. And Giles um, was working with Lummi Nation in their effort to, to feed her. And it was sort of a, a remarkable effort because it brought together scientists, um, Lummi Nation and governmental agencies to, try to feed what Lummi tribal members kept saying is a is a community member. Is that Ellie, do you do you have anything to add to that? No, you're just nodding. Yeah. It was sad because Scarlett didn't she starved. She didn't make it. Um Sorry, I so, have to go back and forth on my phone <laughs> see it, see everyone on the other screens. So I'm wondering if perhaps Giles or Rob, you can talk about starvation and Kohalmichten and what's going on with, um, 
with all that. I smell it. I smell it, too. I smell it. Right here, right here, right here. Oh my. This is pretty great that we're getting action shots. Giles in action. Rob, I'm wondering if you might jump in and let us know, like how, how many salmon, like what's the connection between salmon and starvation of Quahomish and the killer whales and this, the Snake River, the Columbia River Basin? Come on your side, Michael. I'm aware of how precious every sample Giles collects is to science. Um, I don't want to speak for her, um, but but boy, I sure don't want to interrupt her while she's working because as you alluded to, for those who, who may not know this, this I, I believe is one of the most powerful early warning signs that we have um, for problems with, with, with these whales because in this, you know, um, just like when you go to your doctor's office and they take a blood sample, um, we can find out, first of all, there's um, sloughed um, epithelial uh, skin cells and so you can get DNA of the whale non-invasively by collecting the scat. You can find the DNA of the, of the fish that the whales are eating, which is mostly Chinook salmon. And we can type that now down to which river of origin that Chinook salmon came from. Uh, Giles has, Dr. Giles has been doing a lot of work on uh, relating that to stress hormones so that we can understand um, nutritional stress, which shows up in in many of the same hormonal indicators that that show up in human bodies um, when we're under uh, nutritional stress or whether we're under um, intense um, uh, emotional stress for lack of a better word we're able to get now um, uh, contaminants um, all sorts of information and and one of the hormones that you can get from that scat sample is uh, a hormone to tell us whether a female is pregnant and so we're learning not only when the female is is conceiving um, but does the does the fetus develop to full term um, before that we didn't count births until a whale was six months old um, i spent quite a lot of i've spent quite a lot of time trying to estimate how much chinook salmon it costs to run uh, the southern resident killer whale population um, each day when we we last did the calculations. There were there were more um, whales in the pot in in the population, and back then it was about 662 big fat five year old Chinook a day um, to keep the population ha you know happy and healthy. That was just to to maintain their population size. If we want them to recover at 2.3 percent per year. Um, for 28 years so that they can be delisted or downlisted, we're going to need to start allocating 75% more than that. Um, so that population is, is going to need, you know, something on the order of, you know, 1100 big fat Chinook salmon every day. And unfortunately, while we're racing to get them those salmon, the broader forces of climate change and habitat degradation are making the Chinook salmon smaller um, and leaner. And so that number itself can be misleading. You know, we need 662 good Chinook, a thousand maybe of the smaller ones, 1500 of the smaller and skinnier ones. We know from our own work that um, moms work harder when they have a calf. We can see it in their breathing patterns. We can see that a mother um, has to surface more often to breathe. Um, her metabolic rate is higher when she has a calf swimming along an echelon formation. So the, catch, the calf is catching a free ride, but it's because mom is working harder to drag the calf along with her um, so that the calf can keep up with the pod. And what our research is showing is that that mom when she is nursing and has a dependent calf, her energetic requirements go up by 43%. And it's every, every aspect of, of killer whale recovery is linked to, to salmon. We're concerned about noise, of course, because noise makes it harder to find salmon. We're concerned about contaminants because PCBs 
the legacy effects of PCBs can cause calves to die, but they're getting their PCBs from the salmon. So salmon is at the root of every one of these problems. At Ocean's Initiative, our, our, we led a team um, that for the first time put all three threats into the same population model. And that I hope was useful um, when the Southern Resident Killer Whale Task Force was trying to say, you know, what can we do? Um, what's enough? That what we concluded is that we, we would need 30% more salmon and 50% less noise. And unfortunately, I would say that in the 10 or 15 years since those models were last updated, the whales are telling us that they are going to, that, that won't be enough. We're going to need to give them even more salmon um, and safe, quiet places to hunt salmon in peace. So I'm, I'm loving watching this, the action from Giles, like this is research in action and it's um, really exciting to see. But I'm wondering, Les or Rob, if you might have a sense of numbers, like, first of all, do our Quithalmachda and the Southern residents eat a lot of salmon that come from the Snake River or from the Columbia River Basin? And what does the, what might removing the Snake River dams do for our Quithalmachda? How might it increase the number of salmon that are available to them? Rob, you might want to talk about the historical numbers. Uh, I would, uh, I am, um, as I think about the conversations that we had during the task force work, um, and in the conversation with Giles um, in, the other day when, as we were doing our planning, uh, it is clear that historically the orcas have have gathered at a place where there was traditionally and historically a huge source of big salmon that provided the kinds of food that Rob talked about. That was the Columbia River. Um, that was the snake that, that, that entered it. It was all the cold high water resources that produced the big salmon in those times. Um, interestingly today, as I was reading and finishing up uh, the governor and the senator's um, initial report, um, it noted something that I thought was very powerful. It said that in 1944, when they began 77 years ago to talk about establishing the dams on the Columbia and on the, the lower Snake River, um, they noted that the impact would be the loss of up to 90% of the of the salmon that traditionally came from those sources in the Snake River and the Clearwater and the Salmon River. Um, and of course, now we have, in fact, with the establishment in, in 1975 of, of, of the Lower Granite and then all of the others, dramatic loss in those resources and that habitat for numerous reasons. Um, it still traditionally has been a source. And if we need more salmon, it's clear to me that we have an imperative to figure out how we open the gateway to give them, the, them their best chance of being able to recover and provide that food for the orcas. And Les, I'm so glad you brought that up. And I'm also going to allude to the conversation that we had with Giles the other day, because I don't know if, um... <laughs> I don't want to interrupt her work, but I believe I'm she good. Said, I'm good. Oh, good. I can actually speak now. We Perfect. had a little bit of a freak out. Thank you, everybody, for bearing with us with that. It was great to watch you at work. But what we're doing right now, Giles, is just trying to connect the Southern residents to the Chinook that come from the Snake River. And how, if you could maybe tell us how important a food source that has been and what removing the dams might do for their food. Um, well, we know that these, uh, that these uh, whales co-evolved with Pacific salmon uh, throughout their entire range from at least Monterey, California up to Southeast Alaska. Um, we know that this uh, Columbia River salmon and specifically Snake River salmon are important 
For them because the whales spend a disproportionate amount for the Snake River. And that's exactly when we see the whales right there at the, um, at the mouth of the Columbia. We also know that the whales, um, you know, they, they co-evolved eating the, the salmon that were the biggest salmon, uh, the very, very large uh, Chinook salmon. And, and um, as far as we know, the Snake River salmon, Chinook salmon would have been the biggest uh, salmon on the, on the West Coast. And I just want to repeat something that you said yesterday because you froze Giles, but I think it was a really important point. I think what you were saying is that the Southern residents go down to the Columbia River to feed. And we have yes. studied this and they've got a habit. We've tracked it. Like they definitely go there to feed. I like it, Michael. That's like the second yeah. Oh, yeah. Right and That's I just right. want to, okay. And when you talk about the um, Southern residents co-evolving with the, the Chinook, of course, I, I think of Ellie and the Lactamish people and other Coast Salish people, where again, there seems to be this, I know Ellie, um, you've often talked about how you're all salmon people, that, that Quithalmichton and Lactamish people are, are salmon people. We can't have one without the other. We both need salmon to survive and we're both in trouble. I'm curious because there's been um, such wonderful momentum of, about taking these dams or breaching these dams. And the Elwha Dam was taken down. And I remember seeing reports that almost the next day, like so soon afterwards, salmon started swimming back up that river. I'm wondering if one or several of you can talk about what, what the success of the Elwha dam removal means um, in terms of salmon numbers, in terms of possibility for our orcas, um, in terms of policy and politics. And Les, I'm wondering if maybe yesterday, I know you had um, some points about that since you have served on the, the oh. task force. Well, I think what I have observed and um, a number of people in our work during that period identified the Elwha. Um, the, to me, the most important thing that it has demonstrated besides the wonderful fact that salmon are coming back is that it is possible. And we're seeing it in the Klamath now, and we're and and the energy that comes from the reality, not only that it's possible for all of us to come together, the interest groups, and realize um, that kind of an environmental step that's made it such a different for salmon tells us that it is possible. It's possible to do this. It has been done and people are moving in this direction, but it also teaches us that it's going to take everyone to be able to figure out how to take the steps to do that. Um, I was thinking this morning uh, about my early career as a psychologist at Washington State University in 1970. Being from Idaho, I am an avid fisherman and a hunter. In 1970, I used to hunt chucker in the Almota Breaks, which is now underwater from the lower from the lower Granite Dam. And I remember the habitat and the beauty of that area. At the time, the dam was just starting to rise. Um, 25 years later, when I returned to Washington State University, I walked the rims of that and could remember as a youth in the bottom with the chucker fishing for steelhead on the banks and to realize and to think that it's not only possible but critical for the salmon 
that we have the opportunity to relive that kind of environmental improvement is something that's just very powerful for me and personal from my own experience. So it tells us that it's possible. And it tells us that you do that by conversation um, and strategically bringing together all of the interest groups and finding a level of commitment that I think is critical. It's not only a message about the health of the orca, as I think we all know, it's a message about our own health and our own future. That's so beautifully put, Les. Thank you. Um, if and hopefully when this those dams do come down, Rob, I'm wondering, is there any sense of what that might do to the salmon population, what we might hope to see from those dams coming down and the effect that it might have on the southern residents? Yeah, I mean, it's easy to throw around numbers, isn't it? You know, that the whales need a thousand um, skinny Chinook a day uh, to survive. They might need 1500 to recover. But that means every day. These are not, you know, humpback whales that are designed to be able to put on lots and lots of fat and then and then um, fast over the winter, you know. These are, these are um, orcas have to eat every day to survive. They have to eat every day to nurse their calves. And so I think what Giles was allud alluding to is that it's not just a numbers game. That it's not ju just that you get to December 31st and as long as there were 300,000 Chinook salmon in the box where the whales live, that you're okay. The whales are telling us by their absence from the Salish Sea in the summer, they're telling us by their return with um, peanut head or um, skinny body condition, God forbid they're telling us when Tahlequah is, is pushing around her dead calf for 17 days, they're telling us that there's not enough. And so it, we can quibble about, is it because, you know, there was this run was missing or that it's the, the size or the, you know, uh, caloric value is, is decreasing. I think what we need to do is have the humility to say that we humans have altered a lot of it. We've altered the spawning habitat. We've altered the temperatures at sea. We've altered the balance of predators and prey. Um, and so the survival of juvenile salmon out in the open ocean. We've, um, we've dammed their spawning habitats. Um, we've made it impossible for them to return. And yet they keep fighting. I, to me, that's the, that's, that's the vision, that's the image that, that always strikes me when I think of the Elwha, um, is, this, is this sheer joy for life the sheer faith that salmon have, that if you can get them through a little ditch, man, if they can find a way to a salmon spawning ground, they will spawn um, and then give their own bodies to, you know, to, to nourish their offspring. So I think, I think we need to keep that in mind. Yes, with the four um, lower Snake River dams, also as, as Les was saying with the Klamath, with uh, even the smaller ones in the Green River near Seattle, um, Sacramento, whatever it is that we're talking about, um, I think we're going to need all of them. We're going to need habitat restoration um, for many, many, many watersheds. I think what we should also do is map the ones that are in fantastic shape. The Elwha is probably now going to be on that list of uh, rivers that are not only producing Chinook now, but 50 or 100 years from now, as a climate refugia, you know? And I think what we need to do is to identify the ones that need to be treasured and nourished and maintained um, for their wholeness, for their integrity that they have now. We also need to identify the ones that are priorities for habitat restoration, for dam removal, for um, removing of armored walls and, and other barriers um, to improve fish passage rates plant trees so that we're shading um, and keeping uh, streams at the right temperature. I, I, I would like to say that there is just one thing that we need to do and that these, you know, dam removals, that's all it is. Do that and the rest, you know, all the, all the other problems magically go away. Unfortunately, we have waited so long and this population is so critically small 
and is one oil spill away from extinction, um, that I think that we need to remember that it's going to take um, almost every tool that we have in our toolbox to make sure that, that we have more fish, bigger fish, fattier fish, year round and throughout the range. Um, and that's very difficult when we elect people um, to represent one pixel um, and only for a couple of years at a time. We need to think bigger. We need to think on the range that a killer whale thinks, the spatial scale of a killer whale's life. We need to be able to plan um, in terms of a killer whale generation or a killer whale lifespan, not a politician's um, uh, period of, of, of um, you know, period of power. Uh, we need to be able to think beyond two or four years. I think this is a giant step towards getting the whales the 30, 40, 50, 60 percent more salmon that they need. Um, it can't be the only step. Rob, I appreciate so much you saying that because the the scope of the recommendations that we made in, in 2019 um, were exactly those points that noise, pollution, food, um, all of those are critical ongoing kinds of steps that have to be taken. We made progress with the legislature in regard to allocation of habitat and hatcheries and did some important discussions and battles to get over some of the first important steps around noise. But, you know, the issues around well watching are not where the big noise is. And we have to take on the big issues that require more complex uh, discussions with our federal government and what our practices are. All of those things together are critical to be able to address the issue of the orca and the salmon. Um, and I'm so glad that you said the issue of the dams are just one of the key components as a source to the health of the salmon that are directly connected with the orca. But all of these things have to continue to work together to be able to address the overall problem. Otherwise, it's easy for people to say, well, don't worry about those dams because the real problem is in the ocean or the real problem is here. That is how we all have to think about this. And we have to continue together to identify all of those and to continue to address them as a whole to solve the problem. You said it beautifully. Yeah, I couldn't agree more or less. And of course, I'm thinking about, um, Ellie, did you have something to say? Well, it, it, it's going to come down to a decision by people. People need to make the right decision and it needs to come before their numbers get to be any less. Uh, people are choosing to either let the Southern residents go or we're gonna save them. We're gonna take those necessary steps to save them. I'm so glad you brought up that point, Ellie, because one thing I've been thinking, and I haven't taken a look yet at the, um, the draft report from Senator Murray and Governor Inslee, it's over 100 pages long, but I know that the idea of mitigation has been big. You know, how do we make sure that everybody's whole in this process? Um, because there are so many people that rely on the river or rely on the dams or whatever. But one thing I've learned from you and other like, and this is a rhetorical question, but I'll let you answer it anyway. Like, is there any mitigation to Quithalmachton going extinct or to salmon disappear disappearing forever? Like, no, and I don't want to live in a world where people choose that. Because if our salmon go away, not only does Quahomishton go away, us as Lummi people go away. You can't have a salmon people without salmon. So it is so, so important that we have salmon for us and for Quahomishton. And it, it's just people are going to have to make the right choice. Do the and right thing. Do the right thing. And I wanted to echo Les's appreciation, Rob, of your point that it's a, a whole system that we have to look at. And again, I'm always learning that from the Lactamish people that the Salish Sea is not just the salt water, it's the rivers, it's the whole system. You can't separate 
the river, from the sea, from the salmon, from the Quathalmachtin, from the people, from the culture, from the spirit, it's all together. But given, and you can't separate US waters from Canadian waters, and Ellie actually has testified up in Canada on several occasions, talking about the killer whales and the impacts of various projects like the Trans Mountain Pipeline or Roberts Bank Terminal 2, all of these things that affect both Quahomishton and Salmon. But getting back to the Snake River dams, what would taking them, do we have a sense of what taking them down would do for the orcas? Are there, are there projections as far as that goes, how, how it might help feed them? I'm so glad that um, my colleague, Dr. Giles, is out collecting data, but I wish she could, um, I wish she could speak because I know she's, she spent an awful lot more time than I have um, uh, understanding how much sh uh, Chinook salmon restoration, how much Chinook salmon recovery would, uh, would happen from the, the removal of the four lower Snake River dams. Um, I, I hate to throw a downer on this, but less since we did the Southern Resident Killable Task Force, um, we have been updating our population models. I, we, at Oceans Initiative, we hired a, a, a statistician called uh, Dr. Ben, ben Nelson to work with Dr. Eric Ward at Northwest Fisheries Science Center to update, the, you know, add 15, 20 years of new data to that foundational relationship between Chinook salmon abundance and Southern Resident Killer Whale survival um, and reproduction. So, Rain, thank you very much for putting in the chat. This is how much more salmon we expect um, will be released um, from the, you know, from this management action. But in terms of its benefit to killer whales, um, I, I say this with the greatest respect. I thought that was, you know, the, the recovery task force, I, I felt it was disbanded, to, you know, um, I was sad to see it end. Um, <laughs> and one of the recommendations that I made was, you know, that those of us who have invested years into building tools to understand what is the what is the probable outcome of a particular management action, you know, our group has led on a lot of the um, work on ocean noise, that if you slow ships down, the whales are feeding more. If the whale launching boats stay farther away, the whales are feeding more. If you create protected areas around key foraging uh, areas, um, that the whales will use them and will feed more. Um, and also trying to understand what is the population growth rate when um, under different levels of salmon abundance. What I had, my biggest recommendation for the task force was that we need to have an open source tool, a population evaluation tool that allows us to say, if we move the dial, if we make 30% more salmon, this is what we think will happen to the population growth rate. If we could dial down the noise um, by 10, 20, 30%, um, this is what it will do to the, the whale's prey accessibility. All of the components of those are out there. All the modules are there. So the tools are there to tell you, to answer your question, Julie, um, how much more births, how many more births should we expect and when? Um, but unfortunately, um, that just no one, no one is thinking on that range wide scale and no one is funding on that sort of range wide scale. No one, no one funded the analysis to duct tape all the recommendations together into one big assessment tool that says, this is, this is how we think the population will grow. Or if we don't do this, or if every industrial development application is approved, um, this is the continued rate of decline. And ultimately, this is how fast it, how long it will take for the population to go extinct. Um, I, I had I the great- saying, oh. I, I hate saying that, but um, no, the tools I, are all there. The tools I, are all there. And I, yeah. I wish that someone had the vision to fund the effort to say, you know, um, here's what the impact, because some of the recommendations were big things that should result in big population growth. Others were were smaller gestures that we think, you know, may improve the quality of life of killer whales, but but won't won't create new calves, won't have whales living longer. And I think that's what we need is is a, a decision support tool 
that allows us to, to predict. Um, we just have a couple more minutes before we need to wrap. And so I want to just make one note and then end with a, a quick question to you, Les. Um, but I wanted to raise, I've had the great privilege of working with Ellie and members of the Lummi Nation. When we would go out and um, Lummi tribal members would hold ceremonial feedings for Kohalmachtin who were starving. And so for Princess Angeline, for Scarlet, for you know, others who went through peanut head, who often died, there were these ceremonial feedings of putting um, a Chinook into the water for, for the Cliff Helmichton. So common sense, like we know that they're starving and it just makes, like I have to look at the Snake River dams and think, even if we get somewhere close to what the salmon population was before the dams went in, it's gotta be a good thing. Um, for them, like there will be food for Quathalmachtin that isn't there now. And so I, I want to end with, um, because the Senator, Senator Murray and the governor have just released this report and there's an open comment period on it. And Les, you mentioned that you had actually read the report. And I was wondering if you have um, any opinions on it. If, did it miss anything? Did, would you want to comment on it? Um, what's your impression of this report and what it might do? Yeah, well, I plan on commenting. Um, um, I thought that uh, the, the uh, report did a brilliant job of laying out the various interests, identifying some of the economic costs that are related to each of those categories. Um, it, um, I think, um, very uh, effectively, I think, laid out some of the parameters in terms of the importance of the tribal interests and what that means in, in terms of the cultural, historical, and at the heart issues of living um, and, and the importance of the acknowledgement and movement in the area of, of increasing the, the, uh, the salmon populations. Um, it also, identified, and, and I don't know the points that I would argue with, um, are that um, the report itself says um, these steps will be necessary before we can move in this direction. Um, um, and I think that in a number of areas where it identifies that we have to take certain steps before we can move in the direction of starting the momentum for the breaching of the dams, are there are other ways to look at that? Uh, I think if we look at the opportunities that exist in terms of clean energy and motivating um, solar and wind power um, as uh, mitigating our replacement cost, doesn't necessarily mean that we have to take those actions before we move towards breaching. There are other ways to be able to think about it. I think our big challenge is um, this work that we're doing in the webinars is brilliant at bringing the various issues around breaching to the public for us to have this discussion. The question is um, not dissimilar to the challenge that we had with the task force. How do you bring together diverse groups in a conversation that will open their ears to the kinds of not only challenges and honest issues that we must address as our people, all of us, spiritually, economically, and in the interest of all of our environment uh, in order to be able to, yes, address the economic impacts of navigation and, and, and uh, agriculture, to be able to address all of the issues that are problems that we've created by building the dams in the first place. We won't get it done if we don't figure out a strategy to bring all of those interests to the table. It won't get done. Um, and we need to realize that that is the next steps that we have to take. How do we then move to the issue of the conversation and bring the people to the table to begin to take those next steps? Because it's possible, given um, what we know about the amount of energy that those dams create, to be able to replace that energy. We know we can do that. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have to wait to do that. We can do that. And there are strategies to be able to do that. And we also know that there are ways that we can address the economic losses 
that may occur from others. How do you bring the people to the table to see how you can do that? The, fortunately, Simpson and Idaho created a, a beautiful document, I think, as a catalyst. And I think this report adds to it. That's the good thing. The question then is, what are the next real viable steps after that to bring people to the table to move it forward? Thank you so much. We'll wrap up here. Um, I want to just conclude by saying less. Yes, we need to all come to the table. And to get back to what Ellie said, we need to do the right thing because I think time is of the essence. We've got hungry with all much den and um, not enough fish in the sea. So thank you, Ellie. Thank you, Les. Thank you, Rob, for your good words and your presence here today. And um, I'll hand it back over to Johanna. Thank you so much for, for sharing all of your words and comments. I'd like to invite Mariska um, on um, to share some opportunities for our audience to provide input, take some action, and see how they can get involved. Thank you, Mariska. Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, hopefully you all can see me. I can't, oh, there I am. Um, well, as what a great segue um, from our panelists to talk about how you can take action. So as you all heard, um, there's a lot of mentioning about this report. And for those of you who maybe attended previous um, dinner hours, we've been alluding to this report that's gonna come out and the, the day is finally here. Um, and so this report, which is kind of a crucial part of the Murray Inslee process that's been happening all year so far, um, is a report that talks about how the services of the dams can be replaced. Um, and where you all come in is that we're amidst a 30-day public comment period. So the draft report was released on the 9th of this month, and it goes until um, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on July 11th. So you all have a couple weeks to submit your comments, and I believe folks are dropping where the link is in the chat um, to do that. And yeah, that is, you know, this is sort of a pivotal moment in the process where after the public comment and input is collected, um, the next step is where Inslee will release their final report and their recommendations um, by the end of the summer. So it's a really important time to have your voice heard. And, you know, if you read the report or read the executive summary, I guess I just want to underscore that you don't have to be a biologist, you don't have to be an expert in energy to be able to um, share how you feel about this issue, how you feel about the report, what's missing, what isn't, how this will impact you, um, and what's the sense of urgency that you feel that you want to make sure that decision makers also feel. So um, that is really our big action item right now. Um, some other things coming up. Any of you who are in the Portland area or want to go to Portland on Saturday, there's going to be a great rally and flotilla happening at uh, Willamette Park. Um, and I believe that they're also dropping a link in how to register for that. So that's a real rally for salmon put on by a lot of different groups. Um, folks from all over the region are going to be attending. So that's a great event to attend. And um, lastly, we have our last uh, dinner hour webinar happening next month. So next month we'll be focusing specifically on the question of how do we stop salmon extinction? Um, it'll be the third Wednesday of the month, like usual, and you can register for that as well. And also, there's all the previous recordings of all of our other conversations over the past, you know, five months. So if you want a little deep dive into some of the topics about um, these solutions to replacing services before you comment, you can always check out our previous webinars to, to learn a little bit more about things like transportation or energy um, or salmon. So um, that's, that's our action items for this month. Thank you so much, Mariska. We only have about two minutes left, but I'd like to invite our panelists and moderator Julie back on to just share any parting words they have for all of our uh, attendees who came to listen in. Oh, Ellie, you're here. I thought I was the only one here. I was just delighted to be part of this conversation and delighted that um, we got to be with JPod. I, I think that was the most exciting part. <laughs> I just want to keep following her live. It's such important work that she's doing. I, it was a privilege to be here tonight. I want to thank you. I want to thank everyone else who's who's on here. And I just want to ask everyone to do what's right.
make right decisions. And I do want to thank everyone. It's, it's so nice to have this conversation and to, to realize that there continues to be so many people that are so deeply committed to this world and our environment and that um, there are steps being taken that hopefully can make a difference if we're committed to doing that. And Les, I just wanted to underscore the point that you made earlier about how doing the right thing by the salmon and by the killer whales is actually doing the right thing for ourselves. When you talked about um, hunting and being part of nature, like realizing that, and again, I um, am always learning from the Lactamish people, but nature is not something that is separate from us. We are part of it. So when we do the right thing by the salmon and by the killer whales, we're taking care of ourselves. We're taking care of our, you know, the whole web of life of which we're a part. Well, thank you so much. I'm so moved by it because um, I have floated and walked the clear water, uh, the middle fork of the salmon and, and the breaks at this and the sawtooth where the salmon river begins the, and, the, and the Grand Ron. All of those places were part of my youth. And uh, the idea that the salmon have a chance to return to those places would be magical for me. I don't know how to top that. Um, <laughs> you don't? <laughs> other than to thank you all very much for this invitation. Um, I have learned so much. Um, I, I think if, if with one sort of parting line, I think what I would say is that with all the modeling that I've done on this population, the whales have told us mathematically and, and with their behavior, they have nothing left to give. Um, the whales have given up as much habitat, as much food as they can. Um, Ellie, you, you, you said it. It, it, we now just have to make the choice. Do we want to have Southern resident killer whales or not? Um, and continued inaction is choosing not to have Southern resident killer whales. Yes. That's a choice too. Um, so I hope we make the right choice. Act now. The whales don't have 10 years to, to wait. The whales no. don't have another generation. I think that's it. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you.